afternoon, Howard Wig, Cold Green, Think Tech Hawaii, welcome one and all. Now, the main topic of this program is generally just straight energy efficiency, but another great way of reducing energy use in the first place is reusing the item that was manufactured. In this case, we're talking about reusing uh, buildings because it takes a heck of a lot of time and energy to tear down the building, dispose, get all the new components, so forth, so forth. Much, much, much better to reuse it in the first place. And I have a local expert in that field, Mr. Eddie Ebert, Principal Manager of RIM Architects here in downtown Honolulu. Welcome, Eddie. Thanks for being on the show here. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's my pleasure. You know, we met each other by talking about the reuse or the use of Albizia wood. For those of you not familiar, Albizia is an exotic species that uh, literally sprung up here. It grows like mad, especially in moist areas. And it's a nuisance in that sense, but it also has a shallow root system. So when we get big tree, heavy rain, and heavy wind, boom, if you hear about a tree falling, it's Albizia. Well, there's one entrepreneur locally who is now making use of the Albizia, and he and Mr. Ebert know one another, and Mr. Ebert is now specifying Albizia products wherever he can in the buildings that he deals with. Mr. Ebert, please tell us how you are using Albizia so far and maybe what prospects you see in the future for Albizia. Certainly. Yeah, and I think that Joey Valenti from Albizia Project would be a great guest for you, Howard. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed uh, meeting him and discussing. Uh, we actually met at the AIA uh, lecture uh, that was sponsored by the Committee on the Environment, C-O-T-E is the acronym. They do wonderful lectures. Uh, the one that we joined was at the Center for Architecture at the AIA headquarters in Honolulu. So I'm really happy for that committee uh, to be providing to the public some of these innovative entrepreneurs who are focused on environment and resiliency and uh, and adaptive reuse um, of both materials, uh, invasive species, and it just leads to um, multiple uh, beneficial effects for the environment and for the Hawaii people and for uh, and for local art. So it was a uh, it was a pleasure to be there, and I'm happy to be uh, here with you on the on the show. So in terms of Albizia products directly, we don't have too much exposure to it. It is new and innovative, like like you had just mentioned. But we did recommend uh, Albizia for the gym that was done at one hotel in Hanalei. And that was a direct recommendation to the owner. Uh, Rim Architects was not involved in that project other than to, uh, to recommend uh, the Albizia project for the adaptive reuse uh, gym. And that's where, do you remember uh, the photos he showed from that, Howard? Uh, yeah, yeah. They're very, very colorful. Good, good looking wood, that's for sure. Yeah, so it was a full gym setup that had basically the, the weights themselves, the plates were made out of Albizia wood, uh, which is a long, which is a, a hard, durable wood that then he had to fill with lead in order to get the, the exact ratios down. But it's a fully functional working gym that was important for uh, the owner of that property to have that sustainability piece and the, the connection with the outdoors. Um, but specifically to have it be reclaimed wood from Kauai, um, manufactured in Hawaii, uh, was extremely important and just a wonderful story. So that's one example. Uh, another example, Howard, is we we're, we're doing one of our clients is working up in Waimea Valley, and part of their scope is to uh, is to construct a uh, a traditional Hawaiian hale, and they have albizia wood or albizia trees on their property. So this is very early in the development, but I'm going to introduce Joey and the Albizia project to Waimea Valley to see if they might be able to harvest albizia within the valley, uh, reuse it, and then construct a traditional Hawaiian hale that will be used for educational purposes for uh, school children and visitors alike. Wow, that's, that can be quite uh, inspirational. 
Yeah. And you, you serve a dual purpose. You're eliminating at least a, a few trees there because they, they do, especially moist areas, they grow prolifically. Absolutely. Yeah. And the hotel you mentioned, it, was the owner uh, striving for lead certification by any chance? Is this one of the check but the owner did get their lead certification, and then they're continuing to uh, to aspire for that. So there's additional phases of work that's that's going to be coming, and lead is part of that criteria for what they would like to see in both the design and the construction and the ongoing use of the building because the programming is as important as uh, as the design and the construction of it. So how you actually operate the building is as key as the uh, materials and techniques that you specify, um, as is as important as them actually being documented and, and sourced correctly and built correctly. Uh, and then once the certification happens, how the building is operated. Uh, that definitely, yeah. Now, LEED is a very, very comprehensive uh, program there. So do you, I, be, I would imagine that you do other uh, LEED projects also. We do, yeah. It, oftentimes, the lead lead projects that we have, we we have at Rim Rim has five offices. So we started in Alaska in '86, and then went to Guam in '87, and then came to Hawaii in 2000, and uh, w went to the mainland from here. So from uh, in 2001, we went to uh, San Francisco, and we had the first uh, lead and resilient certified building in San Francisco, uh, 85 blocks of Avenue. So we're very proud of that. Um, and we find that there's many, uh, many projects that we, that we have are, um, are going for multiple certifications. Um, but another current one we have on the books is, uh, is the UH Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. It was originally built in 2013. I believe it was a lead gold and they had some shelled space, some interior space that was, um, uh, that was never built out. They, it's inside the shell of the building, but the floor the floor plates are empty. And we have a project to bring a phase one clinical trial center. So you're basically taking the research from cancer center, bringing it to patients here in Hawaii, and it's utilizing an NIH grant with uh, matching state legislative funds, and it is um, it will be lead lead certified. <laughs> And so this is, is it actually going to be a clinic where medical work is done? It is. It will be an outpatient clinic. Out, outpatient. Okay. So, you know, it occurs to me, neither of us uh, defined lead. Can, can you uh, give, give us a little background here? Because, you yeah. know, it's part of our jargon, but not part of uh, everybody's jargon. Absolutely. Uh, uh, lead is, a state, is an acronym. It's L-E-E-D. And it stands for uh, leadership in energy and environmental design, and it is uh, uh, a program that is uh, endorsed or uh, certified through a, an organization called uh, the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, they're based in Washington D.C., and they're um, they've basically been a, a seismic shift in how buildings are designed, constructed, and used. Uh, so many of the uh, the facets they, that they put into place um, that they started probably more than a generation ago have now become the standard for how we design. So they've 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 seismically shifted uh, the way that buildings are designed, uh, sourced, and constructed. So they are um, they're critical to assessing climate change, meeting ESG goals. Um, they enhance resilience. Um, supporting more equitable communities. So um, they reduced contribution to global, uh, global climate change. They enhance individuals' human health. Uh, they protect and restore water resources. They um, protect, enhance biodiversity. Um, they promote sustainable regenerative material cycles, reducing off-gassing um, and to other toxic materials. Uh, and then ultimately they enhance the community way of life, uh, quality of life. Um, and they, they, they advocate for building reuse. They advocate for density. They advocate for public transportation. Um, a lot of the things that, that are, that are already happening here in Hawaii, uh, incorporate many, many of these lead concepts that were pioneered by uh, U.S. Green Building Council. And I'm proud to say that the, I work for the state government and, uh, for the specifications for new construction. 
if you're a, doing a state building is you don't know the exact language, but you must aspire to design for lead. And I think the caveat when economically feasible, but a lot of the new state buildings, and I believe the city buildings also, are designed with lead specifications. And as Mr. Ebert described, it's a very, very broad, broad environmental uh, approach there. Yeah, and, and it, it, as a reminder, Howard, it, it costs money, right? It's, <laughs> um, but they incorporate, you know, life cycle cost analysis oftentimes into their um, into their um, designs, and and the idea is that the the energy savings and the, the the passive heating, cooling, the increased insulation, and just the the benefit to the environment will pay for itself over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That oftentimes is true, but there there oftentimes is a higher upfront cost. There's a higher investment to it, so it attracts a certain type of um, of owner operator or developer one that one that is looking to hold the the, the asset for a long time um, because often it, just from the design standpoint, it can add you know up to ten percent uh, to a design fee, and obviously a contractor then would need to source uh, usually higher quality materials or locally sourced or sustainable materials. Which also has increased costs, and then the documentation of it is an is an added cost. Um, obviously, the the benefit often outweighs that investment, um, which pays for itself or should theoretically. But I appreciate what you just said, which was uh, the state mandates uh, that 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 buildings are. Uh, what was the word you you used? It was a uh, lead lead attainable the, or the, uh, yes, when, when economically feasible. Right. Generally speaking, I hear about new state buildings coming up. They are being at least designed to lead. Yeah, I appreciate that because if you mandate it, then it can be counterproductive, right? And it can just increase the cost of, of living for anyone in Hawaii because those costs of development get passed on to the consumer or the, or the, the, the tenant. Uh, the military often does, the, does something similar, which, which uh, they design to, to lead sta standards or they actually use the UFC, which is Unified Facility Criteria. And they have a chapter on sustainability that talks about that as well. That says that when economically feasible, they will incorporate these sustainability, these sustainable design concepts. And as I understand it, the military does have a budget. Uh, I believe a lot of the new military structures are are going up like that. Absolutely, they are. It makes sense because they're long term owners. They're the ones that need to operate, maintain it, and it, it, it makes a um, economical sense, operational sense. Um, so many factors to it, um, and it's a responsible use of taxpayer money. Yeah, um, yeah we can talk about military investment or military um, military initiatives when it comes to green green energy use as well. Howard, I don't mean to sidetrack it too much, but I know that there's um, the military often gets a bad rap based on its um, sometimes environmental record, and and oftentimes you hear about you know these um, uh, catastrophes that that hit the news, but really when it comes to uh, to sustainable energy or uh, renewable resources, you know, the Department of Defense is probably has it in their interest to find a renewable um, energy resource um, to wean themselves from their dependency on oil more than anybody. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if you'd imagine, you know, the, the 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 great cost that they go through to ensure that their that their vehicles and bases are are able to be operated in remote locations, if they could find a 100% renewable um, power resource, that would be um, incredibly beneficial to them. Yeah, much easier when you design like that, much easier to become what we call zero net energy mm -hmm. versus you have photovoltaic panels as well. And your energy use is so low in the first place that you're able to make that up with photovoltaic panels plus uh, battery storage to keep, keep you through the night. Yep. I had a recent guest who specializes in, uh, what do they call it, remote deployment, where suddenly the military has to go to a remote area, usually in a poor country, and set up an airfield for, to you know, get meet some emergency. And they have made that whole airfield complex so efficient that they're able to be totally, totally energy uh, independent. And they can set it up in days. Also, another uh, tri tribute to to energy efficiency. 
What uh, what sort of lead buildings do you have uh, around here in Hawaii? Um, the, the one currently on the board is is at the cancer center, mm -hmm. uh, and then most of our most of our other sustainable buildings have been have been done through our military portfolio, which again it, they're they're designed to uh, the sustainable standards of uh, the government, but they do not they step they 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 take one step short they don't actually get the lead certification for it. So, and it occurs to me, you know, one benefit, side benefit of lead design is generally these buildings are healthier. The air flowing through it, it's a good amount of air and it's pure air. And I'm thinking of the cancer center. This is outpatient. You want that environment to be clean and healthy. It so sounds like you're meeting those specs here. For sure, and there's another there's another aspect to a uh, building environment that's important that may have been an offshoot from lead. I'm not sure exactly what, how it came from or where it came came up, but it's the concept of well certification. I think we we talked about that a little bit a few mm -hmm. days. Yes, yes. And that the well certification basically talks about how it applies the science of uh, the physical and social environment to benefit the health and well being and the performance of the people in the building. Mm -hmm. so, a simple way that I look at that is that the LEED certification has to do with the building's impact on the environment in terms of it being coming from sustainable sources, uh, increased water retention, um, preventing storm runoff, uh, imp improving the quality of the air in the building, like you just mentioned, improving the quality of the water of the, the for the occupants, improving thermal energy performance, reducing energy usage, um, looking at life cycle performance of, the, of where the materials are actually coming from. Um, wellness, well cert wellness certification talks about the, the the impact of the building on the people, on the occupants, which is part of lead. But this 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 is more of um, uh, health and humanity focus. So it's the impact of the building on the person. So that has to do with quality of air, quality of light, circadian rhythms, um, programming, healthy food options, clean water. Um, you know, breaks. It has to do with with how that building is operated and how the people. Uh, are treated within the within the building itself. So that's another great um, great aspect that again the cancer center was looking into for the well certification, but that ended up being a value engineered out of the design process. Well, I know that uh, most health centers, and I'm thinking particularly of retirement homes, uh, a view to the outdoors is mandatory in many many of those areas. And particularly retirement homes, uh, people don't get out much. Mm -hmm. So if you have a big view of what's going on in the outdoors, you're able to keep your circadian rhythm. And it also generally has a very soothing effect on the uh, occupants of, of the building. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we humans evolved over at least 150,000 years, and it was... Only in the last few years that we began spending uh, the majority of our time uh, indoors. And even in healthy Hawaii, we beautiful Hawaii, we have, I think the average person spends at least 80% of his time in, in the, the indoors. So having access to, to daylighting and a view of the outdoors is a very, very uh, important health issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And going beyond that, oh. Uh, when you design for energy efficiency, what what do you uh, incorporate in, into your uh, buildings or or your retrofits? So for energy efficiency, you look at the the entire building envelope, right? Um, so it, it has to do with how the structural system impacts, you know, the thermal the thermal envelope of the building. So you're you're, you're looking at things like heat gain. Uh, most of that is through how the building is oriented, whether or not it can capture trades, whether the ha whether or not it has operable windows. Um, the thermal gain of the solar gain through the through the windows into the occupants. Um, obviously, southern southern facing exposures being in the southern hemisphere, even though we're very close, we're much closer to the equator than anywhere else uh, in the U.S. Um, is very real. And so, taking into account all of those, and then the building insulation itself, either within the walls or within the within the the roof uh, envelope or the roof structure, is extremely important. Um, we've been asked to evaluate again some health clinics some outpatient clinics a separate client and initially the um the clinic was uh, was operating it was too hot they, they, the hvac units couldn't maintain 
uh, the temperature that needed to be maintained for, for patient comfort. And they wanted to come in and add additional HVAC units, um, which would be an increased cost, right? And uh, because they were operating, um, but they were renting these units. So it made sense for them to invest in the new system. Well, we came in and we said, well, wait, let's evaluate the building envelope first. And we discovered that the uh, they were renting the space. They didn't own it. But the building uh, owner did not have proper insulation, or at least what we felt was adequate insulation in the, in the, in the roof system, the roof and ceiling system. Mm -hmm. So we were able to propose and insulate the roof at a fraction of the cost that, it would have, that they would have spent on new HVAC system um, and eliminated their, their, their need for supplemental light AC that they were renting. So that's an example of a, almost an immediate no-brainer um, in, in implementation of building insulation, improving thermal performance that then reduces HVAC load, that reduces energy. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was a nice case study that we did that added value um, to the owner. But that was one where you know we did we we a, we asked why <laughs> or dug into dug into what the owner was really was really desiring, which was to um, provide adequate cooling for the patient. Now there's different ways you can do that. You'd rather provide more cooling or you provide a building that doesn't require as much cooling. And the effect is, is much better the second way, I think. Yeah. Another, another analysis was was what we, uh, is a adaptive reuse building that we're doing here in Hawaii, where they're converting it from an office building into uh, hospitality. And it's an old building envelope that has single pane glass and the owner is evaluating what new system to to put in um, to install and whether or not what's worth the investment. And so we had the structural engineer look at the building sway because it's an old steel frame building. And as the building moves with the wind, um, different uh, curtain wall systems that can that flex with that. And then there's seals along each of those joints that then can over time can then let air and, uh, and heat um, either infiltrate or escape, right? So evaluating if the building needed to be stiffened um, and if a new uh, curtain wall was put in, what that deflection uh, would need to be. And then of course, if the curtain wall, new curtain wall was put in, if it's double insulated, then what is the thermal savings of that in terms of the amount of heat gain? That, and then that we had our mechanical engineers evaluate what that reduced heat load would be and what the future anticipated operating costs would be for that. So we really had four different consultants working on that 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 uh, issue all together, um, and that's another example of how we would provide um, building systems efficiencies to an owner to solve a problem and an investment that they're looking at making long term. And what what about window film? Do you look at, at film as as another option to reduce the uh, solar heat gain coefficient? Absolutely, you can. Um, and we've done that. The building, the existing building I just described did have a, a solar film on it, but there's limitations to it, especially if you're looking at one pane glass rice two pane. Um, there's only so much you can do. And then once that film over time, um, you know, starts to start to come off, um, then the, the, the cost of labor to to uh, replace it uh, is exorbitant. Uh, and so in this, in our situation, it made, it made more sense to um, to replace the curtain wall, um, which is not feasible for most clients, the film would be probably a much a much better, uh, depending on where you are, the life cycle of the building or the life cycle of your curtain wall. Howard, that is absolutely um, probably a, a reasonable uh, first step or intermediate step um, prior to replacing. And something we're looking at very carefully in the terms of building codes is reflective surfaces. First and foremost, a reflective roof, and our current energy code actually requires that in our climate zone and the other southern climate zones, new construction, you must have a reflective roof. And it makes so much sense here in Hawaii that we actually took it a step further and specified California's Title 28, which is about 10% more efficient than even the, the national code. And our next step is to specify reflective walls. They don't have to be white. It is to have certain pigment reflecting materials in the coating so that the sun's heat bounces back to the atmosphere rather than uh, gets absorbed into the walls and then into the living space. That's great. Yeah, that reduces uh, what's called heat island effect. Mm -hmm. 
then can uh, adjust entire, you know, it, it creates microclimates of, of, of hot spots, especially within urban areas. Obviously, vegetation, uh, shielding through trees can, can help enhance that, but you're, you're absolutely right, especially the roofing material can, can reflect that the, the heat from the Earth's, the, from the sun back into the Earth rather than absorbing it, creating an even higher, hotter environment with a darker roof. Boop. Yeah, we've all been in environments, say, say Kapiolani Boulevard, very, very beautifully tree shaded. That is, you wouldn't think of an urban environment like that as being pleasant, but by George, it is pleasant, thanks to all, all of those trees. No, you're exactly right. So that clinic that I was talking about that had the um, the, the HVAC uh, issue, uh, the, they didn't have enough cooling, they had a dark roof. And that's what we did. So we not only added insulation, but we but we lightened it. We created we created it white from I think it was originally a like a blue or something like that. And I think they mm -hmm. the roofers that were up there took a took a thermal gauge on it, and I think it was a hundred and fifty degrees different between the dark roof and the light roof. Wow, I have seen differences of over seventy degrees, but a hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. That means the original roof would be. Whoa, close to boiling point. Yeah. Wow. Very impressive. Hey, we have about one minute left. Any closing thoughts on energy efficiency or adaptive reuse? I think, well, adaptive reuse is, is natural. It's a natural solution here in Hawaii just because there's, there's so few open areas to build ground up. So I think most architects you'd talk to in Hawaii, Howard, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not special by any means. It just has to do with the nature of our market and where we're at. But Hawaii can be is, is such a model for the world, right? Based on our increased density, based on our limited resources, based on you know, our, our, our focus on sustainability. We have a lot to learn from ancient Hawaiians that, that set the standard for us that I hope we can get back to in terms of being, being better balanced. But um, everything in Hawaii, everything we do comes back to us so much faster. You know, the cycle of life, um, you know, whether you treat people, treat people well um, just in passing, but that extends to the environment, extends to sustainable, you know, um, food sustainability and security, to energy security. Mm -hmm. to, it's yeah. all just so intertwined here and so visceral that it's, uh, I'm, and I applaud you for what you're doing to, to help, help move that needle and push us forward to a better place. So thank you. It's a pleasure to do it, and uh, thank you. And on that very nice philosophical note, celebrating all the Hawaiian lifestyle, we must bid fond adieu. Eddie Ebert, thank you so much for appearing on this program. Thank you, Howard. It's a pleasure. Audience, see you next time. Bye-bye.